Hello once again, Science and Ponies here, bringing you another, hopefully, educational video where I will attempt to explain some particle physics with ponies. Now I tried to boil this down, strip as much math out as possible, and assume as little prior knowledge as I possibly could, though I did still make it a bit more advanced than my prior video at the request of some people. If you feel like you need to, I'd recommend going and watching the previous Nuclear Physics Explained by Ponies, which will just give you a little bit of grounding in the conversion of matter and energy and how they're the same thing. Well, without further ado, let's get right on to it. First up are quarks. Quarks are the elementary building blocks of the rest of matter. Pretty much every other particle is made of quarks, except for a category called leptons, so electrons and neutrinos and such are actually their own fundamental particles. They're not made up of quarks. But everything else is made up of six distinct flavors. Now, flavors obviously have nothing to do with how it tastes. You can't really taste fundamental particles. You taste molecules, but nothing really below that. These are just words we came up with to describe that this quark is somehow fundamentally different from this other quark. So we called it flavors. And these flavors are up down, strange, charm, truth or top, and beauty and bottom. They used to be called truth and beauty, now they're called top and bottom. The old joke for why they changed the name was, it's too confusing because truth is beauty and beauty is truth, so blame John Keats for that. Now, matter also comes in three families or generations. The first one, made up of up and down quarks and electrons and electron neutrinos, are what most of the universe is made up made up of. So it's what you'll encounter day to day in the universe. The other two families or generations are more exotic. The particles are much heavier and you don't really see them as often. They only really pop up in high energy particle collisions, so in particle accelerators or in high energy cosmic ray collisions in the upper atmosphere. And they don't seem to last very long. The all, most exotic particles are really unstable, so they have very short lifetimes. You don't run into them very much. So family one is where what most of the universe is actually made up out of. Of course, every quark has an anti-quark, its antimatter counterpart. So we have anti-up, anti-down, anti-charm, anti-strange anti-top and anti-bottom. And like all antiparticles, they have equal mass and spin, but opposite charge. Spin is something I'll explain in a little bit. Another interesting property of quarks is that they actually have fractional charge. They're the only particles that have a fractional charge. Fraction of what, you may ask? Well, this is based on the electron and proton charge. These actually have a fraction. So up charm and top quarks have a positive two-thirds charge, whereas down, strange, and bottom have a negative one-third. Together, quarks combine to form hadrons, which are just basically any particle that's a combination of quarks. They combine to make a particle that has, you know, integer charge, like a proton or a neutron. Down here we have an up, an up, and a down to make a proton. It's two-thirds plus two-thirds minus one-third is a positive one charge. And neutrons, an up and two downs, sums to zero. And again, electrons, muons, and tau particles, muons being the family two lepton and tau being the family three lepton, they all have integer charges but aren't made of quarks. Another interesting thing quarks have is something called color. Like flavor, color does not actually have anything to do with what it actually looks like. It's just another word we made up for an intrinsic property it has. And color is slightly analogous to electric charge, whereas electric charge is important to the electromagnetic force. It has a positive or negative value. Color charge is involved in regulating the strong force between quarks, what holds quarks together. 
also a remnant of this force is what holds protons and neutrons together. So the quarks are attracted to each other, so the quarks and nearby nucleons bind together and hold each other together. So instead of a positive or negative value, there's actually three different choices. It can be red, blue, or green. These make these quarks different from each other, kind of like a lazy palette swap. But thing is, when you add red, blue, and green together, you get zero total color. The result is colorless. And though a particular flavor of quark has a fixed electric charge, up is always two-thirds, down is always negative one-third, any particular flavor can be any color. You can have a red up, a blue up, a green up, a red down, a blue down, a green down, etc. Antiquarks actually have anti-colors. There's anti-red, anti-blue, and anti-green. Put anti-red and red together, they all, the result is also colorless. They cancel each other out. And those of you who've taken a little bit of physics or know anything about color theory will know why I picked cyan, yellow, and magenta to represent anti-red, anti-blue, and anti-green. If I want to get into that a bit more, maybe I can make a video about the physics of color. So, moving on to more complicated composite particles, baryons, mesons, and color confinement. There's this important rule that for a particle to exist as a discrete entity, it must be color neutral. It can't have some total color to it. This means an individual quark can't exist outside of a larger particle. So, some terminology here. Hadron, any color neutral particle made up of quarks. So anything that's made up of quarks. Baryon, which is a hadron made up of three quarks, one red, one blue, one green. Together they're colorless. These are protons and neutrons and such. Antibaryons, you can get the result with made of three antiquarks, anti-red, anti-blue, anti-green. Those are also colorless. And mesons. Mesons are a bit more exotic. They're one quark and one antiquark of the opposite color. They tend to be unstable and very short-lived. Over here we have a proton, we have red up, blue up, and a green down. Here we have a meson. This particular one is a positive pion. There's actually positive pions, negative pions, and neutral pions, depending on what you decide to make them out of. Here we have a blue up and an anti-blue anti-down. So this is actually a positive value since the anti-down has a positive one-third value since it's the antiparticle with opposite charge. So total charge is positive one, and the color is colorless because blue cancels with anti-blue. And I said earlier that quarks can't exist outside of larger particles. You may be thinking, well, why don't we just try to pull it out? What'll happen if we actually do that? The thing is, since large amounts of energy convert into matter, and you need really large amounts of energy to try to pull it out. The strong force is named strong for a reason, so you have to pump in tons of energy to just rip it out. So they're packed so tightly that if you actually pump in enough energy to pull it out, that energy will create new quark and anti-quark pairs, which will then combine to make new hadrons. So the very act of pulling a quark out creates other quarks that bind to it. So sadly, you can't get a quark on its own. Next up is a property called spin I mentioned a little while back. Now, if you've taken any basic physics, you might have heard of something called angular momentum. It's a quantity that needs to be conserved, something we have to pay attention to. This picture on the right, if you spin a bicycle tire, then it has some value of angular momentum pointing in a certain direction. Usually use the right hand rule. If you curl your fingers or your right hand in the direction of motion, your thumb points in the direction of angular momentum. The faster you spin, and this depends on radius too, the faster you spin, the stronger angular momentum you have. In addition to any orbital angular momentum that particles may have from whatever motion they're undergoing, they also have this innate property called spin. It's kind of like an intrinsic momentum as if the particle were spinning in place. Not to say that it is spinning in place. For example, electrons are pretty much single points as we understand them. They can't really spin. 
but it has this little bit of momentum as if it were spinning, so we just call it spin. So like regular angular momentum, this spin has direction. We usually say particles oriented spin up or spin down. Next up are fermions and bosons. I know I'm throwing in a lot of different particle vocabulary at you. Bear with me. Fermions are particles with half integer spin. They can have values of one half, three half, five halves, etc. Again, they can be up or down. Bosons, particles that have full integer spin, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Again, they can be oriented up and down. 0 would pretty much be the same, up or down. Quarks, electrons, and all el elementary particles and antiparticles are fermions. They have a spin of 1 half. It's the simplest type. So basic building block particles all have spin 1 half. Photons and mesons and some more exotic particles are bosons. Don't run into them as often, except for photons. Those are pretty common. Light's pretty much everywhere. Now for the Pauli exclusion principle. I mentioned this briefly in a previous video, and a lot of people wanted to know what this was. Well, it simply states that no two identical fermions can occupy the same quantum state. This applies only to fermions and not bosons may be asking, well, what is a quantum state? Well, here's an example. For electrons, whenever we talk about fermions, we love to use electrons as an example because they're so readily available. Quantum states for electrons correspond to their orbitals in an atom, atomic orbitals. If you've taken any chemistry, this may look slightly familiar to you. If you're about to or taking chemistry, well, here's some free study help. First up is the energy level. By the way, there, uh, it depends on four factors for the quantum state. First, the atomic number of uh, the quantum numbers is the energy level, n. This is simply the energy shell it inhabits. If you give it more energy, it pops up higher. Occasional pop back down, it has to get rid of that energy. It usually sends it off with uh, photons over here are different energy levels. The next two have to do with its orbital angular momentum. We usually say this affects what orbital or suborbital it's in. So the second number is L, which can have values ranging between 0 and n minus 1. Like down here, there's only really one choice. That would be 0. We represent S is 0, P is 1, D is 2, F is 3. Don't ask me where the letters came from, I still have no idea. We go up to energy level 2, we have more options. More energy, we have more options for how our angular momentum is arranged. These are different, like, we usually describe it as different paths the electron is taking in its orbit, which gives it different values of orbital angular momentum. If this gets too confusing up here, just look at the lower ones. The third number is the projection of that momentum. Basically, if this is our value of angular momentum, this is where that direction is, where the direction that that momentum is pointing. It can be pointing up, down, or some angle in between. As we have higher and higher values, we actually have more options of how we can orient it. There's a bunch of different angles in between we can point it at. This can have values between negative L and L and correspond to these little slots in here. As you go up higher and higher, more and more slots for each orbital become available. These are sometimes referred to as suborbitals. And finally, the last one is spin orientation. For electrons, which just have a spin of one half, it's very simple. It has positive one half or negative one half. Spin up or spin down. Which is why, if you're taking any chemistry, you know you can fit two electrons in each of these slots. One is an arrow facing up, one is an arrow facing down. And that is represent a spin-up electron and a spin-down electron. You can't have more than two in here or else they would be sharing the same quantum state. And that is forbidden by our exclusion principle. A little extra thing of note is that protons and neutrons are also fermions. They also have a spin of one half. So the nucleus as a whole has to obey this exclusion principle. Meaning, as you add more nucleons, be they protons or neutrons, 
there's only so many different arrangements they can have before they have to pop up an energy level to have more energy just to be in that nucleus. So if you just keep piling on neutrons, thinking neutrons will make it more stable, it'll actually become unstable after a while because you're overloading it, giving it too many neutrons, too many fermions in one area. They have to have higher and higher energies until really it's just a more energy effective layout for the nucleus to split. So this is why piling on more nucleons can actually make something less stable. Now a little something on Fermi level and Bose-Einstein condensates. Fermi level is just the highest occupied energy for a system of fermions at absolute zero. You take a big collection, say electrons, you chill it down to absolute zero so they don't have a bunch of extra energy, they're not jumping around everywhere. And the highest occupied level is the Fermi level. That pretty much just depends on how many electrons you have. Since they can't show the same state, you go up to higher ones. Now bosons, bosons don't have to follow this exclusion rule at all. So at absolute zero, they can all share the same state. There's nothing keeping them from just chilling at the same level and clumping together and forming a Bose-Einstein condensate. There's a very interesting state of matter. It's on the opposite end of the spectrum from plasmas. And essentially, you get a bunch of bosons together, like, say, a helium-4 nucleus. Helium-4 nuclei are actually have an integer spin. I believe it's a zero, since you can have two of the nucleons being spin up and two spin down, and they cancel. You have them all clumped together in a Bose-Einstein condensate, and they actually act like one giant super atom. It's really cool. Of course, for temperatures above absolute zero, which is most things, particles have higher energy. They have some thermal energy. They're bouncing around a bit. And fermions are usually inhabiting higher energy levels than you know, their bare minimum. They're being, electrons are being excited. They're jumping to higher energy levels, bouncing around quite a bit. This is where we bring in something called the Fermi-Dirac distribution function, which is its... Hmm, how to say this? It's kind of like... The Fermi direct function is, for any system of identical fermions in equilibrium, the probability that a quantum state of energy E is occupied. My word, man, don't you know your quantum statistics? Uh, yes, that. Thank you. The Fermi Dirac distribution function tells you the probability that any given state of energy E the probability that it's occupied. So you take some energy level that has some energy E, you plug it in here with a temperature, temperature T over here, this is just a constant. This is again the energy E that you're looking at, and this is simply the energy of the Fermi level. So the Fermi level, the highest occupied level at absolute zero, what energy corresponds to that? This is the number E, by the way. And if any of you are good at algebra, you might notice a little something, is that as temperature goes down to absolute zero here, this term will actually shrink as long as we keep, you know, E below uh, the Fermi energy here. This whole term starts going to zero, making this probability approach one. So we start getting a 100% probability that an energy level of the Fermi level or below is occupied, which makes sense, considering it's kind of part of the definition. The Fermi level is what's occupied at absolute zero, so it and everything below it would be occupied, which is good, which means this equation isn't completely wrong. And I just wanted to throw that in there. Now we get into some hazy stuff even I don't quite fully grasp, so if I mess this up, feel free to catch me on it if you know more than I do. Virtual particles. Virtual particles are very hazily defined. They only sort of exist, and they're generally made out of energy borrowed from other particles or a local field. They only exist for a very short amount of time. Then again, a lot of, re quote, real particles sometimes exist for a very short amount of time. Yeah, I later found out that 
virtual particles probably shouldn't be called particles at all. They're more disturbances in field that are different from regular particles, but I'll charge ahead with this model, since it seems to be very popular. The four fundamental forces of the universe can be thought of as being carried through the exchange of v these virtual particles called gauge bosons. I like to call them force carriers, because that describes what they do. Basically, this model of thinking about forces, like gravity or electromagnetism, whenever particles feel a force at a distance, we say they're exchanging virtual particles that mediate this force. They feel this force through the exchange of these gauge bosons, virtual particles. These only exist, they don't really exist on their own, they only exist through the interaction of these particles. Over here we have two electrons coming in. They exchange a virtual photon and feel a repulsion. Isn't to say that this is, you know, pushing them apart because if one of these was a proton, they would still exchange a virtual photon and then feel an attraction. That's why this analogy is slightly strained. Point is they're kind of lobbing these virtual particles back and forth to feel forces. Here we have our four fundamental forces. We have electromagnetism, generally based around charge, and the exchange of virtual photons. We have the strong force, so it binds quarks together and holds together nucleons in the nucleus. This is actually based around color, and the virtual particle are gluons, quarks throwing gluons back and forth to each other. The weak force, which I was going to include in this video but cut out because it's already running pretty long, is actually based around flavor. They exchange W plus, W minus, and Z bosons. When these are emitted or absorbed, they can actually change the flavor of a quark, turning one type of quark into another, and they're responsible for some types of radioactive decay like beta decay, which I mentioned in a previous video. Maybe in the future I'll go into the details of how this works. And gravity, which is of course based around mass, and gra the graviton, which is just a hypothetical particle, this hasn't actually, be, actually been tested or observed yet, but is just kind of placed in there because it seems to work so well for everything else. Put this in. Needs further study though. It may not act gravity may not work with bosons at all. Gravity hasn't really been unified with the other forces quite as well. We don't have a good understanding of quantum gravity. So the graviton is just a placeholder for now. And finally, a cool little interesting thing involving virtual particles, that you can actually get something from nothing with it. In empty space, there's little virtual particle and antiparticle pairs that are constantly popping in and out of existence. They pop into existence before they annihilate each other. They always pop up in pairs. Whenever you create matter from energy, you get a particle and an antiparticle. You have to keep that balance there. The thing is, though, they're doing this out in the middle of nowhere. Often it seems like they're borrowing energy that isn't actually there. So, pretty much cheating on the conservation of energy. How is this possible? Well, actually, something called the uncertainty principle states the products of uncertainty for an object's position and momentum have to be greater than a minimum value. You've probably heard this stated as you can't know an object's position and momentum at the same time. Here's the actual statement of it. This is kind of your range of position. It could be anywhere from like here to here. And here's its range and possible momentum. Together, they have to be greater than this value over here. This is the h-bar, it's Planck's constant over 2 pi. So there's some minimum value that you can't know both of these beyond a certain level. If you narrow one down, the other will expand. Thing is, this can be re rewritten with a bunch of math that is not shown here. I had to do it once. I don't want to put that all into this presentation. You can convert this into time and energy. So if some event happens in a range of time or a particle's lifetime is short enough, it can have a really vague open amount of energy. This kind of vagueness here is where these virtual particles get away with having energy that they probably shouldn't have. So essentially, if this process happens fast enough, it's too fast for the conservation of energy to catch them. They get away with bending laws of physics just because they do it quick enough. Here's a little demo. 
kind of like that. The last little thing I wanted to mention was something called Hawking radiation. Sometimes these particle-antiparticle pairs become separated before they can annihilate. And since now they existed far too long to be virtual anymore, they're forced to become real. And they have to borrow this energy nearby, usually from the energy field of whatever separated them. If it was an electric field that was pulling charged particles apart, they would take it from there. If it's a gravitational field of, say, a black hole, if this happens right at a black hole's event horizon, beyond which, you know, light can't escape, so gravity's very strong there. One particle gets pulled in. They can't annihilate. So they borrow this energy and gravitational field, or essentially from the black hole itself. They take energy or mass, since energy and mass are pretty much the same thing at this level, from the black hole in order to become real. And the one outside goes flying off. This means the black hole is actually emitting some type of radiation, which puzzled people for a while. It's like, how can a black hole lose mass or emit any radiation if not even light can escape? Well, this is the method that black holes can actually evaporate and lose mass. This is called Hawking radiation. And that's just fascinating. So a quick little review of some terms I threw at you. Hadrons, they're just made of quarks. Anything made of quarks. Baryons, three quarks, one red, one green, one blue. Protons and neutrons, etc. Mesons, a quark and an antiquark of opposite color. Leptons, they're other elementary particles not made of quarks. Fermions, anything that has half integer spin. And bosons, anything that has integer spin. Gauge bosons being these force-carrying virtual particles. And now, you can act like you know something about particle physics. And this was, well, let's say, exhausting to put together. Hopefully, if you saw that I used anything that you actually made, like any of the little vectors that popped up, let me know so I can thank you properly. I mostly grabbed everything from uh, Google Images. So I was originally going to do a bunch of quantum mechanics stuff, like particle in a box and quantum tunneling. But I was already kind of all over the place with this video. I didn't want it to run even longer than it already has. So I might do that another time. Don't know when that will be. I could also scale back and actually do something you might see in high school physics like, say, how rainbows are made, which I already have most of that material together. Or I could explain how n nuclear weapons work. Basically, post your suggestions below. Thanks for watching.